Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. We're so very excited to be able to get things going today. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, we're really excited to get things kicked off. Uh, so welcome again thank you so much jess and i are very excited to have you all here after a long spirit period of planning uh so welcome to our kind of number one uh start of the day here with our panel with some lovely individuals i will introduce in just a moment um so thank you to them for joining us as well this will be the one kind of live piece of the summit for the next two days so thank you so much for joining us this video will of course be available later on our youtube channel just as as well as all of the other videos from today so thank you so much to our entire committee for getting things organized and getting this event going today and as well thank you so much to our interpreters who are here to join as well so thank you to them very much so we put this panel together, Jess and I are very excited to be able to offer this. Uh, we originally wanted to have this kick off our summit last year for our 10th anniversary. So thank you all for joining us for our 10 11th anniversary. <laughs> um, it's been really a fun thing to chat with you. Mute. Sorry, I don't know why I keep getting I keep getting muted. I apologize. Um, so we're excited to be able to kick things off for this year for the for our panel. We wanted to really have something put together for our 10th anniversary to really celebrate the fact that we are really the flagship conference for games user researchers. And we'd like to we are hosting this kind of keynote panel with the industry veterans on the past, present, and future of games UR and UX. So a couple of notes about the panel. We will have a live Q&A at the end of the session. So please go ahead and find the Q&A uh, section on Zoom and drop your questions there. So we will have a few minutes, probably 10, 15 minutes at the end. So we'll be able to get all of your questions over there. Just make sure they're not getting lost in the chat. We want them over in the Q&A uh, box on Zoom. So. To introduce everybody and get everybody up here with me so I can stop talking for a moment. <laughs> We're very excited to introduce our panelists. We have Raymond Romero, Experience Director at Sony Interactive Entertainment, San Diego Studio. Veronica Zamito, UX Strategy Consultant. Jennifer Ash, Design Lead at Bungie. Mike Ambender, Principal Experimental Psychologist at Valve. And Ian Livingston, Senior Manager of User Research at Blizzard Entertainment. So thank you all so much for joining. I'm hoping that everyone can unmute themselves. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm going to get things off a little bit, um, chatting a bit about kind of the early days of user research. So I'm excited to be able to kind of go back in time a little bit to some of the early days that many of us weren't around for. So specifically, I'm want to chat with you, Ian and Veronica. We're celebrating the 10 years of Games User Research Summit. Uh, it would have been 10 years, obviously, last year. But what are your most fond memories in terms of uh, kind of what this event has accomplished over the years? Uh, I mean, for me, like, I, I, I didn't get to attend some of the, the, like, the very first or second. One. I, think I, I think the first one I came to was the third one. Um, and what I remember back then was just relatively how small the, the group was. Like we were in a pretty small space in uh, San Francisco. And maybe there was, I wanna say maybe a hundred people. I think that's probably stretching it. Um, but uh, since then, this has just expanded so much. Uh, I don't know how many people are on this, this call right now that I can see, but I heard that there were you know, hundreds of, of people registered for this for this webinar and this this conference this time around that's insane and and how we started as researchers and we we've, we've grown into design and i expect it's going to keep growing into uh, analytics and other fields as well it's just it's been intense um the other space that uh you know i i look at fondly is just how much we've maintained uh, the desire to share information um this this conference really is about learning from each other and it's been you know, it's, it's so hard for people in the industry to come together and, and, and share with, with a degree of honesty. Um, it's been really cool to go back and watch uh, videos over the years um, and just see how much 
we've grown in as a discipline. Um, and that's been that's been really neat. Veronica. Yeah, I was already going back on memory lane as you were describing all that. Uh, I, I've been part of every single summit since the very beginning. So like, they were like, you know, flashing memories, um, the, the very small hotel, you know, conference hotel room uh, that it was the first one that we were just literally a shoe horse table and all of us fit there. Uh, to the point that, you know, how it has been growing on the last, uh, well, throughout the last decade, it, it is, it's just like day and night of how much this discipline has, has grown and the involvement of people. So that actually is, uh, you know, extremely heartwarming. And something that I kind of want to like kind of double click on, on the, on the discussion about sharing, something that was amazing for me from the very first GERT Summit was, was about the openness to discuss and share what we do and how we do research. I think that that's probably a, bit, a little bit on the trade of you know, research and science and we have methods and probably it's a bit unique as a discipline in the game industry that everyone can describe exactly how, how they do their work, how they do their trade, the challenges that they face. So there's no straight secret IP that you know, we cannot talk about it. It's not that we have a you know, secret sauce algorithm that cannot be shared outside the four walls. Uh, it is about, this is how I do research. Uh, you know, this is my tools, my approach. And it has been always very open and on the table. And I think that, that has been fantastic and something that has enabled that growth of the discipline. And it didn't matter if you, know, if you were EA or Microsoft or Ubisoft or any studio or, or university, like everyone was at the same level, everyone was listen to everyone was asked about how they did it so that equalitarian level of that's why we do research and we can learn from each other i i think it's one of the key aspects of, of what gaming research to me creates this fondness and very intertwined fabric of of a community um, and another aspect about this fabric is how more and more has increased from a multidisciplinary background point of view. So in that sense that, even when we talk about the definition of uh, games user research, it, it is psychology and computer science and ergonomics, art design, you know, everyone has to hear about like that definition of GER. But I think it's not just a definition. I think it's truly embodied. And when you are in a physical room or in a virtual room and you see all these backgrounds coming together and it, it increased the richness of discussions, of point of view, I think it emphasizes also the cross-functional collaborations that happen in the game industry. And I've seen a lot of people throughout the years you now coming into research or evolving into other roles where this richness of backgrounds had actually been an asset and has really, really open, keep people open to discoveries, new point of view, and a little bit of a humbleness that you need all these different point of views to, to really keep understanding things better. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, when you were talking about openness and, and, and relationships. It, I remember the first conference I attended, I don't remember who the speaker was, but somebody was, was you know, addressing the audience and they said, look to your left, look to your right. These are the people you're gonna be spending your career working with. And I remember like being so early in my career, just rolling my eyes like, okay, yeah, like whatever. And then I look at everybody on this call and I'm like, ah, man, I've known you guys for 10 years now or more, that's intense. <laughs> I think that's one of the really kind of cool things about the summit. I think for me, I obviously haven't been around for 10 years or as long as many of you have, but in my 
five plus years of being involved in the community, it's been really, it's been really nice to be able to kind of get to know these familiar faces and be able to kind of see you all once a year and be able to chat with you and really learn. And I think that's what's really been really remarkable for me, for our community. So I think even looking back at kind of the early years of games user research, even going back to like the mid nineties, early 2000s, uh, Jen, Raymond, like, what are some of the most pr things that you're most proud of in terms of kind of what the GER discipline has achieved in the industry overall? Uh, well, maybe I'll start. Uh, and I just have to say it's Ramon, but uh, <laughs> but that's all right. Uh, um, so uh, going back in time, there was, um, you know, this uh, initial inclination in the early stages of GER um, from us uh, when we were up at Microsoft, just try and connect with other researchers who are out there. Uh, we were new to it. We didn't think we were the only ones doing it, but it took a while to kind of form those connections. And over the course of uh, that, that decade, um, numerous times we came to GDC and spoke and ran a usability tutorial and numerous things that, that team uh, did to just try and form connections and to educate the industry about the existence of this you know, games user research role. Um, and so on. And I had this funny experience where about 2009, I actually stepped away from games research and went and worked on the Xbox platform for a while. And so I was present for the first one that uh, Ian was, uh, I think, just speaking about a moment ago, you know, just a conference room, a big projector against a screen kind of uh, presentation thing. Um, and about uh, six years later, I come back, uh, 2015 or 16, and, and it's this huge venue and there's a ton of people and it's this amazing uh, like community, and I, I, I don't know half of everybody. Um, and uh, that, that's, that's amazing. And I think it's a real testament to how, uh, you know, all the organizers of this conference over the course of time have uh, really just been uh, pushing the ball forward and carrying us to greater and greater heights. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I feel about uh, the case. Go ahead, Jen. Yeah. I think uh, similar to what's been mentioned a couple of times already here, but I think the growth and maturity of both the UR and the UX industry and uh, disciplines has been really impressive to see. Um, like thinking back, like, yeah, when it first started out, like it started out as a round table and then there was a summit and there were like 30 people in a room. And now like, like everyone's saying, like it's really grown, which has been really impressive. And I was fairly early, I was early career at that point when they started out and it's impressive just to see like how big it's grown and how well like well established for a young discipline it is across different companies and that's been really exciting to see and also how people have grown their careers over the years too has also been really interesting um i've I've done both UR and UX roles. So it's, uh, I'm gonna try to probably focus a little more on the UX side uh, in this group of panelists, but something that's really interesting to think back on is that there wasn't really UX design roles at, when I first started out. Um, there was UI designers and there were user researchers, but there wasn't that kind of like design focused coming from a particularly more of like a cognitive science side of things um, development at studios. So it's really exciting that now there are teams, especially the larger companies that are able to focus on that and really define what the user is and define the goals and then work with, you know, utilizing user research. There's a, definitely a Venn diagram of the skill sets between the two, but that's been really exciting to see. Um, and also just like, uh, like I believe Veronica mentioned, like how many disciplines are coming together to create, to build on these disciplines and kind of evolve them as they go forwards. Um, one of the things that's super exciting for me is like looking at how much now we're learning. Like there's multiple conferences a year now that are focused on on Grox. Like uh, the, not only this summit that kind of started things out, but then there's the Games UX summit that happens and there's the GDC track and there's a bunch of different uh, avenues now that people can learn and get to meet and get to know each other and kind of build their skill set, which is really exciting. Um, and then also just building resources like there's books out there now that you can reference that aren't regarding software design like that's super exciting. We're focusing on games and understanding what makes them unique and what kind of what you need to learn from them. There are classes being offered at you know colleges like I've taught at DigiPen and UR topics, which is super exciting to see students actually gaining some knowledge before either taking an advanced degree in order to get 
the skill set or just kind of like understanding that this is a role that exists within game development and to include it in, as part of their process is something that I, I feel is super exciting to see. Um, and then, yeah, just the fact that there are shared communities now, like the Discord groups and Slack groups that are focused in these disciplines that help people share and meet each other and grow what we've got today um, has been super, uh, yeah, it's just super exciting to see how we've achieved and grown just 10 year period where there's some established uh, disciplines everyone thinks about when they think game design. I feel like it's really exciting that this is now a strong presence within that. So it's been cool. Yeah, what I'm I'm hearing a lot of um, like growth and, and maturation is something we've seen over the course of the last 10 years, which is just really incredible to hear from um, everyone's perspectives. And Jen, like you mentioning that, like when you were starting out, the UX design discipline wasn't really established in games. And we are now seeing that is the case along with user research. So let's kind of pivot and discuss some of like the current trends and where we see user research and UX design heading. Because we know that UX design and research has generally been a tool for development teams to craft better user experiences. So in what ways are you all seeing user experience design and research grow and gain visibility beyond the inner circle of the stakeholders focused on design and development? Yeah, that, that's indeed something that has been at, at the core of this evolution of these disciplines. Uh, and the extreme tight partnership of UX research, conducting the, executing the research, providing those insights, and then making very concrete uh, improvements to the, to the game. So it has been, uh, that bread and butter has been on the, on the tactical improvements to the game. But I think that there is something else as a trend that has been uh, happening throughout the years and which I've been very passionate about and dedicated uh, my focus on the yeah in the last few years uh, around uh, UX maturity, and I think that that's that other layer of how UX research and UX design have been evolving and actually increasing that circle and that impact and the, the layers that it has. And what I mean with that is. Uh, looking at all the roles uh, within UX and how they are part of the company organization, how it's actually now affecting uh, those processes, not just the UX process, but actually the game development process. And ultimately it's affecting the culture of the company. So by taking these UXR and design to the strategic level, you now also have other stakeholders uh, that are you know, beyond the media team members. So in that layer, you are including now more, more executives. And what I mean with that, many places would be those VP and above uh, staff at the company. And it's not necessarily the VP of, of product, but it could be the VP of operations because they, they need to know now what is UX research doing? What are the deliverables from UX design? How is this being part of the machinery of creating a game? So now it needs to be uh, accounted for, put part of that process, understand what these disciplines are delivering at certain milestones. Now, in some cases, in some company has been fantastic to even uh, acknowledge at an explicit level that certain uh, type of research or amount of research needs to happen before they hit a, a gate, a milestone at a certain part of development. Um, that would be, again, like from more of an operations point of view. But then you also have those other stakeholders that are uh, could be in finance. And this is beyond the eternal ROI of, uh, of UX research. We'll leave that golden goose egg for another talk. But it is about the impact that uh, is having on the game, how the reaction from players is having. It's about, are we building the right game? Is it resonating with players? What's going to be the type of perception? So now that you have this other like level of uh, stakeholders that you know, in many cases prefer as leadership of, of a certain game studio or company. 
So that circle has increased. Um, the other aspect that I see on, on trends is about uh, different type of, of groups that we need to keep working on tighter relationships and collaborations. So uh, we have in many places, uh, the group of live ops. Uh, as the games have evolved from the box that is being shipped and then do, 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 we're done. Now everything is it's a live service. So live ops has been yet another discipline has grown a lot throughout the last years that we need to be in constant conversations um, to make these improvements and actually stay on that active. And uh, accessibility also has been huge. And if there are many games user researchers who are specialized uh, in accessibility, but I also see in some places that now accessibility has become its own uh, group and its own department. And how we can keep that really close collaboration with them to make these uh, uh, improvements to the game. So those are gonna like, kind of like most of the two new ones. And then the other ones that we need to keep close together are the marketing folks. Uh, we really, we talk about player journey and we need these other partners who are going like truly from, from end to end. And in some other companies, even uh, analytics might be also like a separate team. Sometimes it's necessarily within games use of research, but they are a key partner that, that we need to keep working together. So all in all, the mature, UX maturity has to make it more complex and we need to make sure that we stay connected and we see these trends coming up and that we have a new sphere of the stakeholders to be, get involved. Yeah, that's a fantastic observation in terms of you know maturity and expanding the sphere of influence. Um, to the others, what are some of the current trends other additional current trends we're seeing in UX research and design in maybe your organizations or the broader games industry? Something. Uh, oh, go ahead, Jen. You go first. Okay. All right. Something uh, that I've seen, especially in this last year's collaborative software, uh, being able to share across design teams, not just UX design and not just uh, user researchers, but sharing across disciplines that normally may not make wireframes trying to create the ability to quickly iterate on designs and especially remote and not being like at the same computer and being able to look over someone's shoulder and be like, what are you working on? Can I, you know, let's talk about this. We don't have that kind of collaboration in this in this environment right now. So uh, adjusting to that. And also I think that's gonna build upon as we figure out what returning to work looks like, building upon um, just being able to share quickly and getting ideas out there and iterating on them is something that I'm excited to kind of see build over time and building libraries to understand that better. Um, and the other one is uh, data informed design. Like I know every time, like every few years we change exactly like exactly what that wording looks like, like player driven design, data driven design. I feel like now we're at the point where we're data informed maybe. Uh, so it's kind of like the best of both worlds. Maybe we'll see, it'll probably evolve. Uh, but looking at sort of how insights are driving the uh, collaboration between design. It's not that we have to act on the data and that's like, that's the only way to head. It's like, no, we're working together to find out where that balance is and understanding how the value of early explorations and getting feedback and then using that to build something and not just uh, being uh, a force to be driven like with and against. It's, it's more of a collaboration now, I feel, which is super exciting to see people utilizing data now um, to help design instead of either side of the extremes um, forcing it. I'll, I'll go next. Oh, Mike? Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. go uh, and just really quickly in, in terms of- I'll go last. So so I don't interrupt anyone else. Uh, in terms of just uh, as a retrospective looking back at this, I'm just really glad we made it, uh, by the way. I remember the round table uh, that Veronica and I were sitting at 10 years ago or 11 years ago. Um, and I'm just really glad that uh, we've made it from, from that, a bunch of people with, with kind of common interests uh, and, and the hope that we could actually turn this into a discipline, into the kind of the, the mature discipline that we have now, which I think is quite amazing. Uh, in terms of, uh, I guess, current trends, um, I think we, we're always curious about what sorts of data we are, are I guess, uh, leaving on the floor. What sorts of data um, are we not taking use of and incorporating into um, 
you know, our, our game design, our playtesting practices, and like, how do we get smarter as game designers? And so like, as a consequence of, I guess, continually asking that question, you start looking at things like, you know, what, what can, you know, machine learning based approaches uh, do for us? What can uh, biometric or physiological signal measurement approaches do for us? Um, how do we get more objective data? How do we identify biases in our current playtesting practices and our, our current user research practices um, and, and improve them? Uh, and then uh, I, I guess, um, uh, uh, how do we get smarter in general? I think just kind of the, the common notion of um, what what sorts of methodologies can we take, um, you know, from, from other disciplines? What sort of methodologies can we improve? Um, you know, like, you know, what are the biases right now and kind of what we're doing? What are the problems of what we're doing? And, and how do we get smarter? Because I think the, the constant struggle to make better games is something that we are all like, we, we all go through and not wanting to take our current practices for granted, right? And so always trying to like look at them with a critical eye and saying, okay, how can we do better? And so I think, the opportunity to kind of incorporate data from, you know, whether it's physiological or some machine learning based approaches or, um, you know, better ethnography studies, who knows, um, but, but the hope that we can actually, um, yeah, I guess, not rest on our laurels, right, and be happy with the progress we've made, but say, okay, like, what are the ways in which the, the data that we um, could be acquiring will help us make, you know, smarter game design decisions in the future? Um, from my end of things, the um, interesting trend, and it's very much internal to our studio, but we have an analytics team and uh, a research team uh, and we work in very close partnership. And there is a, uh, a really cool thing we're doing. I'm gonna have somebody come back to the conference here next year or something to talk in more detail. But broadly speaking, we uh, have, I think this goes to one of the chat comments I see around uh, adding qualitative research. Uh, we're combining um, uh, the kind of research that where you end up with like a journey map uh, for people hitting various points in their experience. Um, and then using the data from, uh, from that to determine when people have hit various thresholds uh, in that journey, and then feeding that data to analytics uh, in a fashion that creates a, uh, a predictive model for the, uh, how we can modify the experience for uh, that individual um, and, and, and all the way through. So I feel like um, these kind of, this is a, important, I think is a very right now kind of thing, but just bringing these two disciplines closer and closer together. Uh, a lot of our research in our studio happens post release. And so we're looking at it from that sort of uh, uh, time frame, not uh, while, um, you know, in development. But um, uh, yeah, this kind of partnership where, uh, yeah, a very qualitative approaches um, that just give you the sort of, you know, broad feel for the user experience, and then instantiating it into um, you know, uh, analytics driven feedback loops to the player experience. I, I, I think it's a really cool bit of work and I hope we'll uh, get a chance to talk about it more in the future. Go ahead, Ian. From, uh, thanks. So, so from my perspective, um, I, I think, is it too soon to say remote studies? I feel like, is that, is that okay? Um, I feel like that's not going anywhere. Uh, it's, it's been uh, so useful uh, in, in what we've been doing. I, I don't see a, a state where we go back to uh, uh, all in-lab uh, work like, like we were, were doing before. Um, another one that has got me really excited is streaming. Um, I know Stadia had some issues this year, but I'm still 100% on board with the, with the technology. You know, I look at how next generation of players are, are engaging. Yeah, those shots fired for, for Dan Cockton. Um, I, I'm really, I'm really excited about, uh, this, this technology. I see people being able to play absolutely everywhere, um, and on the same games, uh, at the same times, um, short and long sessions. Um, and I feel like this is, this is going to be a trend that just picks up more and more, um, as we go forward. All right. I think we've got time for one last question for the panel before we shift over to like general advice and audience questions. So um, this is gonna be kind of a double barreled question and which as researchers we're not supposed to do. So I apologize in advance, but um, essentially we're talking about all these trends, right? All of these ways that we're seeing our work shift and all of these trends happening that, you know, we're kind of having to pivot maybe how we go about doing our work. So especially for burgeoning and junior researchers and designers, how do you think they should prepare themselves for these broader shifts we're seeing in UX design and research, or conversely, 
in what ways can veteran researchers and designers keep up with these evolutions that we are observing? Okay, I'll, I'll go. I'll go first. Ah, go. Every time. Uh, <laughs> I, I do want Ian. You go. You go. Uh, okay, so um, uh, for me, I think uh, the thing that I see is, is current platform uh, interaction is pretty well understood and covered uh, at this point by by the way the way that we do existing research and the processes that we have. Um, but I feel like the intersection, and this is kind of touching on my point of streaming. I feel like the intersection of one platform to the next, um, and how different mediums and media uh, are now being um, brought into the overall interaction is, is going to be a, uh, a really cool space for uh, future research and, and, and students to, to, to really start kind of studying. Um, and as an example of this, I see like when uh, people are playing with uh, streamers on, on Twitch, you know, you were, you were taking a passive media of watching somebody else play and you're making it interactive you now, which is obviously a logical step um, in that evolution, but um, how does that uh, fit in the overall experience of, of play, right? We, we've generally been so focused on, on an individual's experience and an individual's social uh, experience when they, when they play and when we study. I'm really interested in um, the, the, the expanding of, of that interaction. Mike? Sure. Um, yeah. So in terms of, I guess, thinking about ways in which I guess, um, you know, younger or earlier career researchers can prepare themselves, I guess, I, I think taking a look at what's happening in industries outside of gaming, I, I think ends up being pretty useful looking at the broader shifts in um, interaction patterns and technology, right? I, I mean, VR obviously has a kind of a, a dominant, as an example, VR has a dominant kind of foothold in the gaming industry, at least, or at least in terms of, you know, people at least having interest in and in wanting to see its potential. But um, looking at how the companies both in and outside of gaming are thinking about the future and the ways in which we're going to, we're going to interact with technology or is definitely going to, inter, inter, you know, inform, um, you know, the kinds of interactive experiences we create. Um, you know, who knows if the, the, the model of sitting on your couch playing a game or sitting in front of your PC playing a game, um, how long that lasts and, and where that goes. And so to the extent that um, you can kind of draw insights from what is happening in other industries to kind of inform, I think that is, uh, a pretty useful way, I guess, of at least staying on track of wh where where things might go. Um, you know, Ian was talking about kind of the intersection of, of streaming and interactivity there, right? And so, um, what, what's the, what's the next thing that Ian's going to mention? You know, five or ten years from now, um, and you know, like, and who's going to identify it first? Um, I, you know, predicting the future is folly and, and difficult and, and you know almost impossible. But to the extent that you can draw on the experiences of, of folks outside the gaming industry to inform what might, what might happen in gaming, I, I think that ends up being, um, uh, I guess, uh, often an useful perspective to take. So. Yeah, and just to, to add to that question, and we're focusing more on these you know, the veteran researchers and designers, um, there's also like life and work gets, gets in the way. So I think that we are, as a as a community, we're very eager to know what's next, what's down the road and, and keep up with trends. And then how do you integrate really that into the day-to-day -day work practice? And I think that that's where uh, for every single uh, group is about finding that sweet spot of being able to question what you do and how you do it. You know, do you need to actually redo or revise your type of research to actually now being able to properly assess this new type of experience or where do you get your inspirations? Or is what we had created in this game and maybe it's a franchise that has been up for a few years when you start like questioning and saying, okay, maybe this needs to be revised. I think it's very easy or common for some teams to just keep chugging along and sometimes not having these moments of put the head above the water, breathe, question and then keep going. So I think that it would be very healthy to incorporate some habits about revision of question your own product, question your own methods uh, every now and then. I'm not saying that you need to throw the baby with the bathwater. Like don't do that, don't question things <laughs> every single time because it's going to lose a lot of inefficiencies and, and processes and then you are losing, losing direction. But 
don't let five years go by and didn't question what we're doing. So something in between, and that will depend on kind of products and, and teams, but uh, put it explicit saying, okay, this is how we do things as of now, things can change, things should change. Uh, let's revise X process product every every so often and, and have that moment of security and, and humbling and openness to, to question it. So it's, it's a lot about habits. I think for early and career focused, uh, I would say something that's important is building a strong foundation uh, because something that you'll be doing as you build your career is modifying that and adjusting to how each company does their research and what they've learned over time and similar to Veronica, like understanding how do you modify that foundation? Uh, because being able to speak to exactly what certain methodologies at their base are, you can then modify it to fit what you want. So I think that's something that's some that's somewhat difficult to understand, like, why are we learning these things? Like, what, why, why is this important? Do you even do this in the industry? Well, it's important to know some of the underlying structure of different research methodologies and design methodologies. So that way you can be flexible as things change. Because, uh, I mean, as we've all seen things we've had to adjust to technology and software, uh, you have to be able to think out of the box when things get thrown your way, like a pandemic, <laughs> like, what do you do? But having a foundation means that you can adjust and uh, make those changes. So it is important to understand where, where, where are you coming from? So what can you build upon on top of that? I think that's something that's sometimes difficult to see when you're in the moment of like, why do I have to go through and learn, you know, exactly what a heuristic design is and exactly what a usability study is and practice it. It's like, well, because once you get into the studio, we become applied science. <laughs> like, so uh, figure it out, make it work and, uh, and uh, adjust accordingly. And that's something that uh, can be difficult transition to understand. Yeah, I'd just add that um, um, you know, for it's actually for junior and uh, advanced researchers, it's just continue to find ways to broaden your horizons. Um, uh, you can look at that. There's a very competitive aspect to it as well. If you want to be someone who's attractive um, as a potential employee at whatever level, um, it's there's this question of what do you bring. There's a lot of resources now that uh, make it pretty. Um, um, I don't know, not easy is the wrong word, but uh, more available, I guess, to become a good, um, you know, play testing oriented user researcher, or a great usability oriented user researcher um, in games. But um, if you've had an experience in some other uh, kind of field um, or been pushed in, uh, into other uh, less typical for games user research kinds of research, I, get, I think that creates advantages uh, for you personally to get to a job. And then uh, for you know your partners that you're working with, and the ultimately the games that we're trying to improve. Um, just uh, and I think I'm just kind of reiterating some of the points there um, that others have stated. But uh, you know uh, other kinds of questions. One who's worked in medical zones or education or um, any number of spots may have some new insight, some some new kind of approach they can bring. Um, and so um, you know uh, game user research is great. But research is great. You can bring, you know, what you learn in games will, would probably make you a pretty cool medical researcher if you end up in that zone as well. This is, this is great. Thank you so much for all of your kind of insights on that. I want to kind of build off of that a little bit before we move into more of kind of the Q&A section for a few minutes. Um, I think it's, if you could give a couple sentences of advice so we have obviously a lot of kind of newcomers coming into the space. We have people who are trying to make that jump from being a junior into more midway to senior. Um, what is kind of the best piece of advice that you all would provide to kind of this younger generation of researchers getting into the field? I'm gonna go first. Okay, we're good, we're good. Uh, ask why about everything. Um, I feel like uh, as a researcher, your job is to answer that question constantly. Um, so you have to ask it first. Um, so why do, why, why do you have that many participants? Why, why would you use a play test? Uh, why are people behaving that way? Um, answer those questions, practice it. Um, 
Oh yeah, Ian is absolutely correct. Uh, and he stole my advice, I think word for word. Um, so just to say something different, but yeah, always ask questions. Um, always trying to understand why people are making the assertions that they're making, um, what has informed their decision making and you know, how did they arrive at that conclusion, right? And so you either, get it, you either gain a better understanding or you might actually figure out that there's a flaw in the reasoning and something can be done and it can be improved. Um, I, I think advice to, I guess, folks starting out in the industry and, and trying to kind of make an impact, acquire skill, get better, um, we're a mature industry, but we're still young, right? There are so many interesting problems and questions that we have not, you know, fully addressed or not yet tackled, right? And so find something that interests you and then go get it. Um, like don't, 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 I guess, simply pursue things as a means to an end to say, oh, I think this will make me, um, you know, maybe more appealing down the line. So find something that you're really interested in and spend time doing that. Um, that is the best way to acquire skill in a discipline is to, you know, be spending time doing something you're actively engaged in. So find the interesting problem, work on that, you'll get really good at it. And then someone will, will end up paying you money uh, to work on problems like that. But as Ian said, uh, always ask why. An advice that I, I would give to more junior researchers would be to think about also the, the meta insights. I think that games is a research and all the training that people come from is about that execution of the research. And I think that you can, uh, UXR and GER is great at those um, tactical micro insights and needs to be building more from there. But look at the interconnections when you have done five sessions, 10 sessions, the whole year at, at that new job. Like, what are those trends that you're seeing? What are those meta insights that are coming along? Those are going to really have a a huge impact into the game in itself is going to spark conversations with the rest of the development team on you know what's really happening are, are we creating the kind of experience uh, that we envision uh, early on in this in this process and it's incredibly how much those uh, connecting those dots and connecting across multiple studies can really help to elevate the whole team and then the piece of advice for the more uh, senior girl folks, uh, it is about democratizing UXR. A little bit of you know, letting things go under your, your umbrella. Uh, you know, sometimes people feel that, no, this is uh, the UXR team job, or this is my role, and I need to, you know, to cover the whole uh, request that might be coming for a certain team. But actually, if you really want to empower the teams that you work with, if you want to empower your own people and actually scale UX research, it has to come to a point where UXR is democratized and other people can do it and that the rest of the game team can do it. Um, the, you know, the, there are ways that you can start scaling that up and what things people could do the UXR by their own and when they can, uh, they have to involve your team. But, you know, think about that there are certain aspects that can be let go and other people to enable to be faster and how it be your outreach actually. So from my end, uh, just adding on to what I stated earlier, you know, certainly for everybody, just bring something more, um, uh, bring something to uh, the work. Um, but I also think, uh, again, this is really for the uh, very advanced folks. It's um, uh, seek uncomfortable roles and challenge yourself to see what you can do. Um, you know, I, and I'm, I'm very much living that. Uh, somebody yesterday, I don't quite concede the point, but they were trying to convince me that I've reached the executive layer. I don't think I'm quite there. Um, but uh, uh, th there's uh, all kinds of very different kinds of conversations and things that I'm involved in. At many days, I don't feel like I'm really a researcher anymore. But uh, the thing that I always try to remind myself is that these core skills I built up as a researcher, particularly the ability to evaluate information of mixed value, um, is critical. <laughs> to any kind of executive sort of decision-making. Um, and so um, I feel that, um, you know, spending, you know, time in, in, uh, in this problem solving space, in this data evaluation space that we all uh, live in uh, really sets you up to be somebody who can, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things you gotta do well if you're gonna you know, really seek the executive kind of roles, but um, a piece where you evaluate what's going on and arrive at the correct decision 
uh, you're preparing yourself to do that by learning this field. So I hope uh, that uh, uh, many of us will seek those kinds of responsibility levels um, with our teams in the future. Uh, something I kind of build on that, uh, look outside of your discipline as you learn skills, I think is important because you can apply them within your discipline. Uh, so just for examples of that, I kind of mentioned it earlier, but understanding data, if you're a designer, often that's not something that you do on a daily basis, like you might be balancing things in spreadsheets, which is very similar, but it's not quite the same. So like learning the base statistics could be very important to building upon understanding your designs and the information that you're getting back regarding behaviors and regarding from from user researchers or analytics um, to understand how you then how that sets your vision and strategy um, to have the impact that you want your teams to have so as you start at a looking at a higher level how do you break down the finer details and understand them and that also goes down to understanding like things from like a production standpoint how do you prioritize what you're working on how you prioritize what features you're going to be focused on uh, you can't do it all <laughs> like uh, you may want to but you can't so how do you figure out what's the thing that you need to focus on and what does that time look like and what do you do when things don't go as planned like how do you adjust i think that's an important thing that uh, may just people consider naturally but a lot of it is something that the production org usually has very strong understanding and skill set within how do you start utilizing that within your day-to-day -day? and also looking at team health especially as you grow your career understanding that there's people behind all these teams and all the development, you have to be able to empathize, you have to be able to support team members as things happen, um, especially, you know, as we mature as an industry, we're going to have things come up in people's lives and that's important on top of work. So how do you balance out um, work life balance on top of building upon uh, just the stress that game design <laughs> brings with releases that that are coming often sometimes or a big one coming forward how do you make sure that you're supporting everyone and building a team that um, that can deliver awesome thank you all so much for sharing this fabulous advice i did want to call out that it's now noon eastern time and we've got about an hour break for lunch on the schedule that said, all of our wonderful panelists had agreed to stay over a few minutes till about 12.15. So if that's still the case, um, we'd be delighted to have you stay a little longer and get to the questions that we have in the queue. Um, but just keep in mind for everyone else who's still watching, we do have about an hour break for lunch. So um, if, you do, if you're still here viewing, you'll have that time to take a break and, and get your eyes away from the screen for a few minutes before our talks kick, at, yeah, kick off this afternoon at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So we've, we have had a lot of questions come in during the discussion. A lot of them do touch on advice, which I think all of you have spoken to already. And additionally, we, I did want to encourage folks in the audience who are asking about advice to consider joining our Discord if you haven't already. We have years of advice questions and links to various resources. So if we don't get, if you want more information about how to kick off a career or elevate your career, strongly encourage you to check out the Discord. And I, I'm sure someone from the committee will send a link in our, our um, chat so that you all can access that if you don't know where to find it. Uh, but I did want to flag a question that was raised, and it is um, specifically for Mike, but I do welcome others to speak to this question as well, because I think it's a very interesting one. So this question asks, Mike, how do you do the range of work that you do? Um, this, research, this researcher has encountered walls with spe specific types of research, sometimes quant, sometimes biometric. So it's nice to see someone like you doing the type of research that you do on top of regular usability testing. Do you have any advice for UX researchers who are trying to have the, that range um, and get that buy-in with their stakeholders to do things that are it, it sounds like a, a little different from traditional usability studies. Um, okay, so, uh, it, well, I, I will answer the question, although I guess I have to give the caveat that, you know, the company I work for, Val, I think might make it a little bit easier than um, potentially other places where there might be more structure or hierarchy in place. Um, you know, I, I work on a range of different things because I'm trying to figure out the best ways to answer the questions that, that I have. And I guess I, at Valve, I'm given the freedom to kind of figure out how to do that and to go accomplish that. And so if you're working in a place where 
Um, and well, I, I guess one kind of downside of that is that I'm spending time doing a variety of different things. I'm probably not getting it, you know, as good as I would be if I was focusing on one or two, right? So there's absolutely, a, you know, a cost in terms of like my effectiveness or efficiency. I think that you, you need to, you know, if you have an idea for a better way of doing a thing, right? Like it needs to be more than just an idea, right? And so I, I carve out time in the day to work on things that I, I think might be useful, right? In the hopes of proving them out, right? And you have to start, you don't have to, but often you, you start small, right? Like what is, uh, what is a more straightforward or simple problem I can solve with this new technique to see if it's effective? And if I can say, actually, yeah, okay, you know, doing this, you're doing biometrics, for example, right? Like if I can say, okay, yeah, we're, we're getting more objective data in this domain and it's going to help with our playtesting and, and kind of, you know, in terms of getting moments, moment insights over the course of an hour, as opposed to asking somebody questions afterwards. I'm like, okay, like, I think there's something there. So let me spend some time on it, you know, when, when I can carve out time and then take it to someone else and say, okay, here's what I have, right? You know, do you agree that this is valuable and useful? Um, so, you know, I, I can't just immediately say, okay, we need to revamp everything and go to, to bad feedback. It's like, no, it's, I think that there is utility in using this, this different approach. And so I'd like to see if it's useful. And so I, I start with a small, like almost self-contained problem, you know, try and apply the, the technique that I'm interested in, you know, if it succeeds, okay, great. I can show it to someone and say, actually, this does work at least in this limited space. Let's see if it makes sense to expand. Um, and, you know, if it doesn't, okay, then, you know, I, at least I hopefully am, am smarter and try and understand why it failed and why it might not work. And then, you know, I can either return to it at, at a later date or, you know, go focus on another problem and kind of, um, I guess, head that direction. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, I, I, I gravitate to the things I'm interested in and my mind likes to jump around. And so that's why I end up working on a variety of different things because it just, that's my natural inclination is to kind of, um, yeah, I guess not always stay stuck in kind of like the same modality or using the same methodologies. And so, you know, over time you learn the things that work really well and end up being, you know, very successful for, you know, I guess, improving the, the quality of the games that we make. But, you know, I, I never want to stop learning. I always want to kind of figure out like, what is a better way of doing things? And so that leads me to try out new, new techniques when I can. Um, and the things that work, okay, then you can, yeah, like show off to other people. Um, I, I, I'm happy, yeah, please drop me a line in, in Discord or, or over email. I'm on the web, web website if you want to like more advice if I didn't answer that question well enough. Because um, it, it is kind of tricky and it is probably somewhat hard to describe in the abstract, but to the extent that you can, you know, try and stay informed or curious about alternative ways of solving problems, um, and then figure out, you know, a small self-contained problem to begin with, um, that can lead to bigger things. Could anyone else want to chime in that one? Chime in as well? I'd, I'd add, I mean, Mike's right. He probably has uh, a lot of freedom um, at Valve. But if you're in a situation where you, you don't find that you have that level of freedom, my advice would be, you know, go out and earn as many trust chips as you can by doing the things that you know are valuable so that you can spend them on things that you think will be valuable um, and kind of explore uh, those topics, right? So once, once people trust you to do things um, that you're, you're doing, then you can kind of approach folks and ask them if, uh, if they'd be interested in, in, in doing some, something more experimental. Yeah, I would just uh, say, um, and it's really, uh, you know, piling onto Mike's point, um, it's just a, uh, you, get really, you get really good at something and then it usually gives you something to build off of. Um, I think there was another question in here uh, around, you know, do you really need a master's or a PhD? Um, and uh, I'm not gonna try and answer that specifically, but what that represents is time invested in uh, some particular method, something that you're already good at. Um, and uh, if you're very comfortable in what you're, what you're doing, then you can get really curious. Um, but I would also point out, uh, and despite this being the guy who's saying, you know, go out and, you know, do other things and bring it to these places, uh, the trying to get massive range uh, can be really difficult and challenging. Um, you know, it looked like for a while there that re user researchers needed to know, um, uh, you know, statistical methods and qualitative research and everything down into like, analytics approaches and um, and you just, let's just see, feel like it was piling on. And at some point you really do have to just pull back and say, I'm not the right person. Um, I've got these sets of skills and, but this is a, a key question. So let me talk to the people who have these other sets of skills and do the range with the team. You'll learn a ton from your partner who's the expert over there. Yeah, the, the last caveat I will add to um, answering that question is have conversations with your immediate team and your extended team about what we want to find out 
And that could open the door about maybe this is not the way that we need to explore these questions. So you can sit down with again with the whole uh, development team, saying like, what do we want to get out from our upcoming research, or you know, what are the questions that you would love to have answered, and and that will will open those conversations to maybe there's another approach, maybe there's um, something else that you could do differently. And it would be a, a shared discussion with the team where AWA is more involved. Everyone would be uh, desiring to have that new question answered. And that could give you that possibility of like, let's try something new. It doesn't mean that you're going to change all your methodologies or we're going to you know, get rid of that, but it's just try it out, see what they want to know uh, and have that little bit of experimental aspect to, uh, to bring some other value that the team is interested in. Yeah. If you can solve someone else's problem, right? That's a pretty effective way of, of being able to, to, to work on the things that you want to work on yourself. Mm -hmm. um, Similar to other things too, time boxing and figuring out, could you integrate it into, like if it's something experimental, can you make it small enough to fit into another study to see if you can prove something out before doing something bigger is another way you kind of experiment with things. Um, so that way you're not taking up a whole time or taking up all of your time, you can you can make sure that it's kind of a proven iterative process of evolving your what you're working on. Awesome advice. Yeah, just fantastic across the board. Um, so for the interest of time, I think we have time for one more question. We had a couple questions in the chat about um, diversity. Um, I think there was one question about how can we, what steps can we take to ensure that as user researchers, we are recruiting from diverse, recruiting among diverse players and getting um, diverse feedback from player communities in our, in our user tests. So that's one aspect of the question. And then the other angle is if I'm a d diverse person, um, what can I do? Like, what, what is this going to be like for me coming into GER, coming into games? Um, what communities are out there? What resources are out there for diverse people wanting to work in games and games user research? Um, so you're welcome to share your feedback from either angle of the question. Well, I'll just uh, state that um, uh, I believe my answer on the how do you get a, a, a diverse audience specifically into uh, this or that study um, is that I right now only have crappy answers. Uh, I think it's a zone where uh, I, I want us to do better. Um, I don't think um, there's probably, you know, sort of a checklist of things where, you know, there's probably specific communities specific schools, uh, well, and you, know, you may know the ethnic breakdown of, um, you know, a given area, um, and then, you know, do some, you know, uh, uh, recruiting people into those zones, uh, into your studies and so on. Um, but I think those are kind of the fairly obvious uh, uh, things. It, 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 there's a great deal of just making sure, um, you know, uh, to take the diversity in a different direction as well. Uh, it's like, Everything you're trying to do to make your product more accessible um, and be a good ally, this is also in that same frame. And it's, um, uh, you know, it, but if you're also trying to fit everything into a 15 person study at most or a five person study, um, and now you're trying to hit representation groups, it's uh, I, 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 uh, help me. I, I want to see uh, great talks on this so I can learn. Uh, I hope there's a couple today. Um, or in the global accessibility zone, but I do believe it's a zone where, um, you know, we've got tricks and tips that I'm sure everybody's pulled off, but uh, I think it's a zone where we can improve. In terms of diversity um, in uh, the games industry itself uh, uh, for employees, it's a zone of interest for me. We are actually uh, trying to improve uh, the diversity in our studio um, uh, right now. And I'm, I'm, I literally have jobs open where we're trying to figure this out. There's interesting legalities that come up based on how you to choose to do uh, recruiting and uh, bringing people on board. Um, but uh, just, I mean, if it helps a little bit, just know that uh, there are people on the other end of this trying to figure it out as well. Um, not just, you're not alone out there um, from whichever community you represent. Um, you know, uh, trying to get in. There's, uh, there's efforts on all ends of this. 
think for diversity of uh, recruiting, I think it'll be interesting to see how remote testing has impacted this because a lot of research is kind of similar to how you see a lot of papers in colleges, which is like recruited from a large city nearby. And it's like, oh, it's the city where the college was in. That's that's cool. Like, so you're kind of limited as to what you're surrounded by. Um, so it's, it'll be interesting as like studios are larger, can recruit from different cities, but also from as we go remote, what that looks like and how that changes things. I'll be super curious to hear how that works um, and how that's kind of maybe evolved and changed who we get feedback from. Um, I know when we were recruiting some things that kind of helped at the time, some uh, some that was kind of an interesting observation. I don't know if it's true, but recruiting with buddies, um, especially for uh, if you like have a potentially a game that is not have demographics that you'd expect, such as, you know, female players, um, having them bring a buddy with can sometimes get you double. <laughs> and uh, and then you also, so you get a larger participant group and maybe it's a little more appealing uh, to come in. Uh, but I don't know, like I said, it's anecdotal. Um, also looking for, yeah, looking for opportunities for where you recruit from and where you advertise from. Like one thing that we advertised at, we advertised at Geek Girl Con because what a better audience than a group of people that are already diverse uh, compared to your normal demographics, uh, seeing that there's an opportunity to do this and being like, oh, wow, this is cool. I never saw this. Um, so like where are some avenues like you know, Comic Cons, things like that, that have a more diverse, balanced um, recruiting, you might find some people that didn't even know that this existed, um, likely. Um, and also just in general, diversity in games, hire. Like there's a lot of efforts going on right now to hire more diverse um, opportunities. And there's more people that have heard about games and view it as a career. I think early on that was very difficult because people are like, wait, you're getting a job in games? Does that even like, can you even live on that? Is that just a temporary thing? Um, I feel like it's, it's be, game development is, is a real career direction now, which I think will also help bring in more of a diverse uh, uh, population um, and also just expose as to like different ideas. Um, but that's how you can build upon things and grab more people is if the people making it are more diverse, hopefully you'll have different ideas that will bring more people into and it's a happy cycle. But um, I think there's still still improvement, but boy, it's changed a lot in 10 years. <laughs> I can tell you that, um, which not saying we're done, just wow, um, there's still a lot of work to do, but it's also been really nice to see what has been, has been done. Yeah, I, I want to augment that uh, like what Jen just said, uh, and to share maybe like ended up more like in a hopeful note, but there has been huge, huge improvements in the last two decades in the diversity of the game industry. Uh, definitely it's not finished, we're not done there, but I, I've seen this landscape change and evolve and be way more diverse than what it used to be. So it's, it's not finished, it's not done, but I think that as an industry, uh, this level of awareness is improving, is maturing. Uh, there are a lot of uh, activities being done within companies and across the, the industry that support this uh, diversity. And, and the way to do it is you know, get involved as well, have those voices uh, being heard. I think that these, uh, these is safe spaces to do that. Uh, so lean on, on your network, connect with others uh, and, and talk about it. I think that the, the risk is to become silence and silence become invisible. So don't don't let that slippery slope get get there. Uh, so just uh, keep keep walking where you want to go, and you will finally have people with with stretched arms to to help you get there. Awesome, yeah, great, really great sentiment to be sharing. And again, just. If you are an underrepresented individual or um, just trying to break into games or games user research more generally, just want to again highlight our Discord is awesome. Uh, we have lots of people men available for mentoring who will, can answer questions and are here to support you. So um, I think that's one of my favorite aspects of this community is just 
how supportive overall this community is. I, when I, I'm three years, roughly three years into my user research career, but prior to that, I was getting a lot of advice from awesome folks, just like you on the discord. So thank you all so much for um, being around, being present in our community and now allowing people like me to give back and also mentor and share with uh, folks who are joining our community and wanting to learn. So I think on that note, we'll wrap up here. We wanna make sure everyone gets a break, gets to eat, rest their eyeballs before we continue with our sessions at 1 p.m. Eastern. So again, thank you. Thank you to our panelists for this wonderful conversation. We've really appreciated your time and for everyone watching, uh, we, we are looking forward to the rest of the talks happening later today in our social event, um, our gaming social as well. So you can sign up to play games, um, check out, Again, refer to those emails we sent out um, or reach out to on Discord if you need help finding anything. So thank you all so much. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you, thank you so much.